So hi everyone. Um, today's talk is by Martin Rochna on topology and, and adjunction in promise constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, thanks a lot and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, yeah, so first I'm going to introduce uh, promise CSPs in case you don't know. Uh, like the simplest example is promise graph coloring. Uh, for example, you're given a free callable graph G and you want to find the one hand coloring at least. Or in the decision version, you want to distinguish free colorable graphs from those that are not even one hand colorable. So you have this uh, strict notion of satisfaction, free colorability, and some weaker notion of satisfaction, one hand colorability, and you want to distinguish between them. Uh, so in this case, the best we know for polynomial time algorithms is that uh, we can do this for free versus square uh, fifth root of n in polynomial time. And that's that's really the best polynomial time algorithm we know. Uh, as for hardness, the best we know is three versus five. If you look at three, col three colorings, then the, the loosest thing we still know is NP-hard is three versus five. So there's a huge, huge gap between those two results. Uh, and the conjecture for now is that uh, at least for any constants, it should be NP-hard. Probably it's hard for, for a much, much wider regime, but at least we'd like to, to prove it for constant, that for any two constants, C versus C prime, coloring is empty hard. And we know this is true assuming a variety of UGC, uh, but well, we don't know about UGC, we don't know about experience of it, so, so uh, we really don't know much about these kinds of problems. And I'm going to look uh, more about, at graph homomorphisms, but of course it all generalizes to, to, to homomorphisms of uh, general structures. Uh, so graph homomorphisms, these are functions from vertices to vertices which map edges to edges. So you can look at them as a kind of coloring. So if you have graph G or graph C5, then a homomorphism from G to C5, you can think of it as a coloring as usual. So uh, you color the vertices of C5 and the edges of C5 use a kind, some kind of constraint. Or the way I'm looking at it is uh, as a kind of embedding of G inside C5. So this view turns out to be uh, quite different and quite useful, for at least for graph homomorphisms. And I write G arrow H if there is any homomorphism. And I also say that G is H colorable because uh, as we know for clicks, it's, it's the same. G is KK colorable, if and only if it's colorable with K color. And then TCSP GH uh, for general structure for graphs GH uh, is the following problem. Given a G colorable graph, can we at least find an H coloring? So we assume always that G has a homomorphism to H. So uh, G colorability is stronger, H colorability is weaker. And uh, we don't care about the cases in between. We just want to distinguish G colorable graphs from those that are not even H colorable. So this is the problem. And the conjecture here is that all the non-trivial cases are NP-hard. Uh, so the trivial cases are when G or H is bipartite or when one of them has a loop, those are trivial. And all the other cases, we conjecture them to be NP-hard. And the reason I like this conjecture is because uh, on one hand, it's quite general. And on the other hand, it simplifies immediately. So uh, this conjecture, it's um, without loss of generality, you can assume that G is a large old cycle and H is a large, a large uh, click of any size. And that's simply because if you look at any graph, it always has a homomorphism to some sufficiently large click. And uh, if it's on bipartite, then it always has a homomorphism from some odd cycle. So if you want to prove this conjecture, it's enough to, it suffices to, to focus on uh, odd cycles and on clicks, so very simple graphs. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, it's still a very general conjecture. So uh, on one hand, it uh, generalizes the, the classic coloring conjecture, so the click versus click case. And on the other hand, it generalizes the hell measure the theorem, uh, which is the G equal to H case. So, so we understand now quite well that uh, CSPs for uh, undirected graph templates uh, aren't be hard. We, we understand that quite well why, why this holds. But still, even the shortest proof is a case analysis on what the structure of this graph is to some extent. Whereas if we prove this more general statement, this conjecture on top, then 
there really can't be any any Keynes analysis on, on what cycles the flicky can do. So, so you would have to prove it using uh, quite different methods, it seems. So that's some reasons for, for, for studying this specific conjecture of the promised CSPs, but of course we want to understand the promised CSPs in, in general and approximation in general uh, and the things associated with this. And in this talk, like the main result I want to show um, in the first half of this talk at least is uh, the following, that uh, we prove like the left half of this conjecture. So we prove that PCSP uh, GK3 is empty hard for all graphs G for which it makes sense, so for all graphs G which admit a homomorphism K3. So uh, if you look at this chain of homomorphisms here, every graph is comparable to some graphs in here. So uh, what we're proving is that the left half, that if you pick any two graphs in here, then the PCSP problem you get is NP hard. Uh, so let me uh, say a few words about the algebraic approach because that's the approach we take to, 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 to prove uh, Hardman's results here. Uh, so we study polymorphisms just as for classical uh, CSPs. We study polymorphism and, and these are the, the set of all polymorphisms has uh, some structure. So for every integer n, we have the set of phenomenal polymorphisms. And, and in the case of promised CSPs, these are defined as uh, just homomorphisms from g times g times g, so the nth power of g, uh, into h. So that's, that's the polymorphism. We have a bunch of such polymorphisms. And then really the only thing we can do with them is uh, we can take minus. So for every function from a final set n to a final set k, we can turn n array polymorphisms into k array ones, uh, just by this uh, usual definition that uh, if you have a polymorphism f of array the n, and you have this function pi, then you can define f, uh, the minor of f through pi, uh, just with this very simple uh, definition. And so we say that f pi is a minor of f, and really it's just the composition of f with uh, the homomorphism from g to k into gm that's induced by pi. So there's not much to work with, but uh, that's the structure we have uh, for, for, for promised CSPs. We cannot compose those uh, polymorphisms with each other. We can only take minus of them, but that's enough to study minor conditions. So minor conditions are simply systems of equations of the form uh, f through pi, the minor of f through pi is equal to g. So in general, we have a bunch of such equations. Uh, so, so there's a digraph. Uh, with some symbols f, g, h, for example, and some arrows, pi, tau, pi prime. Uh, the symbols have specified arities, some integers, and the arrows have specified functions between the corresponding sets. So, so maybe a better way to depict this is this diagram where the nodes are finite sets, uh, the arrows are um, functions between those finite sets, and if you really want, you can label these uh, nodes with uh, symbols f, g, h. And we say this minor condition is satisfiable in uh, Paul GH uh, if we can map those symbols to appropriate polymorphisms. So you can, if you can find a polymorphism f of parity m uh, in Paul GH such that all of these equations described by those arrows are satisfied. So that's what it means for a minor condition to be satisfied in uh, the structure of polymorphisms. On the other hand, the same thing, the same diagram that we have here, it's an instance of label cover. So, so uh, this diagram here, we say it's satisfiable as a label cover instance. If you can pick an element from each of those final sets, from each of those domains, if you will, you can pick an element, if, uh, from the domain of f, from the arity of f, such that uh, if you look at any arrow, uh, say the arrow pi from f to g, then pi of if has to be equal to ig. Like the thing you pick for g has to be equal to uh, some function of i of f um, as defined by the diagram. So these minor conditions, you can, you can think of them as, as equations uh, uh, about polymorphism, or you can think of them as instances of label cover. And the idea is that uh, in many cases, polymorphism behave very similarly to um, to just choosing one coordinate out of n, and because of that, they're similar to label cover, and because of that, they're NP-hard. 
Um, so in particular, if, if something is satisfiable as a label cover instance, then it's satisfiable in, in, as in polymorphism. Uh, whatever structure G and N, like regardless of the structure G of H, you, G and H, you always have the projection polymorphisms, which are defined as projecting G to other entities on coordinates, uh, and then composing this with some arbitrary polymorphism from G to H. Like this, this homework just doesn't matter. So if something is satisfied as a level cover instance, it's satisfied in any polymorphism minion, and in this sense, it's, it's trivial. Um, and it turns out that these binary conditions are the only thing we, we need to study. So, so the theorem in this case is that uh, the problem PCSPGH is log space equivalent to distinguishing minor conditions that are satisfiable as label cover instances on one hand, uh, and conditions that are not even satisfiable in polymorphisms. So, so satisfiability as label cover is this very strict notion of satisfiability, and then satisfiability in polymorphisms is. Uh, is a much weaker, much looser notion of satisfaction. So it's again a promise problem, uh, but now we don't have the structure G and H anymore. We just look at uh, more abstractly at polymorphisms and, and the equations they satisfy. Um, and as I said, the idea is that uh, in hard cases, this polymorphism should be similar to uh, projections. Um, so, so it's similar to just choosing one of n coordinates. Uh, and then this problem you get here, it's just label cover. It's, it's nothing else than label cover, it's just exactly label cover, and that, that's why these problems are really hard. And this problem here, uh, this distinguishing between those conditions satisfiable here and not even satisfiable there, we call it uh, PMC for promise minor condition, uh, and it's parameterized by, by the structure of polymorphism. So, uh, Let's apply this abstract uh, theory to proving that uh, PCSP is empty hard uh, in the case of uh, odd cycles versus C3. So C3 is the same as D3. So why do we look at polymorphism? So we look at graph homomorphism from CK to the N into C3. And we want to prove that somehow they, they, they behave like projections. So that choosing such a polymorphism is uh, the same as choosing an element of n or just a few elements out of n, for example. And the main claim, the main idea here is that in this case, uh, when, when k is fixed, because we, we fixed k and we look at polymorphism of very, very large arity and much, much larger than k, then those polymorphisms, I claim, they look like a junta, so a function that depends on only a few inputs, uh, plus some noise. And the way we like smooth out this noise is that by looking at this polymorphism as a continuous function. So we look at it as a continuous function up to continuous transformation. And it turns out this will like uh, smooth out all the noise, but we'll forget all the noise. And all we will be left with is a function that indeed depends on only a few, yeah, on only a few inputs. And because of that, it's again, similar to projections. It's similar to a gap label cover instance. And because of that, the problem will be empty hard. Okay, so, so we want to look at a polymorphism F, uh, or any, any graph homomorphism uh, as a continuous function. So how do we do this? Um, well, the crucial construction here is the box complex. So box complex is something that to every graph assigns a topological space. So to a graph G, it assigns a topological space box of G. Uh, for example, for a cycle, uh, an odd cycle, uh, gets uh, the box complex of that will be a circle. Or if you start with a click on k vertices, uh, the box complex of that is a sphere in k minus two dimensions. And uh, if you have a graph homomorphism from G to H, then it, this will correspond to a continuous map uh, box F from box G to box H. So the exact construction of box G is not, not that important. Here, here you have two examples. Uh, the idea is roughly that uh, you duplicate every vertex and then um, for any set of white vertices and black vertices which are fully adjacent, you add uh, a face between them. So that, that's the rough idea. And for example, for K4, you get uh, some complex which looks like this. And this is for topologies that's just equivalent to a two-dimensional sphere. But really the only 
important thing about this construction is that it behaves well with, with respect to products. So for example, if you look at the products of a few of cycles, uh, like in our case, uh, what you will get is a torus, a product which is circles, so a torus. In general, if you have a product of n cycles, you get an n-dimensional torus. And finally, I have to add, uh, this is a slightly more technical, but uh, in order to say that some topological maps are not trivial, uh, it's useful to, to look not just at topological spaces, but actually at topological spaces equipped with an involution. So there's a function uh, minus, uh, which swaps some vertices. Here it will swap white and black vertices. Um, and this gives some additional structure on, on this topological space. So, so the box complex is not just a topological space, it's a topological space with this involution. And from a homomorphism, we don't just get a continuous map, we get a continuous map which respects this involution. So uh, uh, f of minus x is the same as minus f of x. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the box complex. So, so what does it mean for, for our case? So we look at polymorphism from CK to C3. So we have this um, graph homomorphism. And if you apply this box complex to, to it, you get a continuous map from an entorus to a circle, as we said. So what we have is a map from an entorus to a circle. And, and how do we analyze this? Well, first, we can look at maps from, from just a circle to a circle, so in this case, the one dimensional case. Uh, so maps from a circle to a circle up to continuous transformations, these are characterized by the winding number of the degree of that map. So it's just the number uh, with, you just count how many times the input cycle runs around the, the output cycle. And then in general, if you have a map from a torus to a circle, then you can look at various circles inside the torus. Uh, so you have like the meridional and the longitudinal cycle and the dimensional torus. And in general, uh, if, if you look at an n-dimensional torus, then for any uh, coordinate i in n, you have the degree of that coordinate, which is just defined by looking at the circle in the torus and uh, applying and looking at what, what, what the function f is on the circle. So formally, uh, we look at the map from x, x is on this, on this input circle, uh, we output f of 0, 0, 0, x, 0, where 0 is just any constant. So we look at these different circles on the torus and we evaluate the degrees. And this gives us for every coordinate i and n, this gives us a degree of that coordinate. And it turns out this degree, it behaves very nicely with respect to minus. So, so that's the important thing because it behaves well with respect to products, uh, because these are all like uh, algebraic construction that, that, that are very natural, they, they, they respect products. Uh, they behave well with respect to minus as well. So if we have this function f uh, with many, many inputs, we can look at its minus of rarity 2. Uh, so those are functions of the form x to y and x to uh, this, for example. And then we can measure the degree, say, on the first one at the coordinate, the x input. And then it turns out, uh, because uh, this, this, those definitions agree with products, it turns out that this is just the sum of the degrees of those coordinates, which are x here. Okay, so the de degree of a coordinate, it behaves really very well. When you identify some of the coordinates, it just sums the degrees together. On the other hand, if you, if you look at all possible minus of rt2, uh, then it turns out there's just finitely many possible. Like there's, there's only so many you can, you can have because uh, all those minus, in the end, they, they came from a homomorphism, from a graph homomorphism. So the number, so if you look at rt2, like n equals to 2, there's, there's only a bounded number of graph homomorphisms like this you can have. And you can only have 3 to the k squared many. And that's independent of n. So even if you like start with f of very, very large rt, there's only finitely many 2 r minus you can get. And because of that, there's only finitely many degrees you can have. Okay, so this means that if you look at those sums, there's only a bounded number of such sums you can get here. And that means that only a bounded number of the degrees can be non-zero. Right? Then if, if you had many non-zero ones, then you can uh, switch them on and off here. Um, 
and yet arbitrarily many uh, sums. Since you have only a bounded number of sums, there's only a bounded number of, of those degrees that can be non-zero. So there's only a few coordinates i and n uh, whose degree is non-zero when n is much larger than k. On the other hand, we, we should also add that, uh, well, someone has non-zero degree, otherwise everything here would be just uh, trivial and, and nothing can follow from it. And for this, this is where we use this equivariance. So uh, if you look at maps from a circle to a circle, which are equivariant, so f of minus x is equal to minus f of x, it's, it's a basic fact of topology that those maps have odd degree. They have odd winding number. Um, and this means that if I add up all the degrees together, then what I get is an odd number. And in particular, that, that simply implies that some of the degrees have to be non-zero. And that's really all the, the whole proof. So this is how we, we take a homomorphism, we take a polymorphism, so a graph homomorphism CK to M and to C3. We look at it at, uh, as a continuous function. Uh, we look at those basic uh, algebraic invariants that characterize uh, such continuous functions up to continuous transformations. These are, those are the degrees. Um, and it turns out that uh, if you look at uh, what constraints those degrees satisfy, there's only a few coordinates that have um, non-zero degrees. So there's only a few like essential coordinates in a way. And in this way, this choosing a polymorphism like this is uh, equivalent to choosing uh, just a few things inside the set of M. And because of this, um, the variant of label cover we get, this PMC problem we get for this polymorphism meaning uh, turns out to be equivalent to, um, or just as hard as, as, uh, as a version of gap label cover. Um, and this concludes the proof that uh, PCSP GK3 is in P-half uh, for all G, um, well, all G that have homomorphs to K3. Okay, so that's, um, that's the idea of, uh, of the proof, um, like the topological proof here that uh, uh, the left half of this conjecture about graph homomorphism uh, is true. So for the second part of the talk, I want to uh, talk about the junction. And uh, we will see a connection to, to the previous part uh, in a moment. Uh, but first, I, uh, well, two definitions, firm functors and firm adjunctions. So a graph thing functor uh, is just a construction, a function from graphs to graphs, uh, such that uh, whenever you have a homomorphism from G to H, uh, this implies a homomorphism from lambda G to lambda H. And thing here just means that we only care about the existence of homomorphisms. We don't care about anything about compositions or respecting products or anything like this. We just ask that if there exists a homomorphism here, then there has to be a homomorphism here as well. And uh, examples of such constructions are uh, the thing I identified lambda k, so just subdividing edges, uh, uh, replacing every edge with uh, path from k edges. Here you have an example. Um, and another example is gamma k. Uh, which puts an edge between endpoints of every k-walk. So, so you look at any two vertices, if they are connected by a walk of length k, you add an edge on top of that. So that's like the k-walk power of g. And I denote this by gamma k. Um, and the fin adjoints are defined as follows. So two such constructions, lambda and gamma, are fin adjoints if we have the following property, that there exists a homomorphism lambda g to h, if and only if there exists a homomorphism from g to gamma h. So there's this way to swap uh, lambda on the left with gamma um, on the right. And for example, there's the construction here, the subdivision lambda k and uh, the k power gamma k uh, satisfy this. So they are fin adjoints. Uh, and more generally, um, like this, Subdivision is, uh, is an example of gadget replacement. We replaced every edge with, with a gadget here with a path. And uh, gamma free, it's, it's an example of a PP power. We defined edges by a uh, positive primitive formula here. And uh, so, so this is one of the most um, fruitful way to get uh, similar agent pointers. Uh, you always have uh, with every gadget replacement, you have an adjoint uh, PP power construction. So lambda-free and gamma-free are some, some examples, um, but in general, 
uh, the spinet joints, uh, the, the, the reason they are interesting to us is because uh, this is essentially the same as saying that lambda is a reduction uh, from PCSP gamma, uh, from this PCSP to this PCSP. Um, and this is very easy to see. This is just trivial from the definition, namely, um, if you have an instance i and you promise that it admits a homomorphism to G, then because lambda is a functor, it means that lambda i has a homomorphism to lambda G. So, so it satisfies this promise. And on the other hand, if you find that this um, reduced construction, this reduced instance lambda i uh, admits a homomorphism to H, then by definition of adjunction, it means that i has a homomorphism to gamma H. So indeed, this is a proper reduction. This is a, a correct reduction from this PCSP to this PCSP. And, and this is really just saying the same thing. It's just, just um, stated as a property of, of, of graphs. Um, but um, it's, the same, it's the same as being a reduction from between those PCSPs. So that's, that's why we care uh, about adjunctions. Uh, or more precise, the gamma H here is like the strongest graph for which, for which we can show that this reduction holds. Um, and in fact, you can always, like, even if you don't know what gamma H is, if you, you just, just have lambda defined, for some reason, you have some lambda, you wonder how the reduction it is. You can always take gamma H to be uh, the infinite union of all structures such that lambda I, uh, lambda I at this upper move is to H. So it's it's kind of trivial. There's, there's like nothing here. Uh, it's just a name for for the structure. But the, the interesting thing is that there's many examples of uh, agent functors which people have studied for, for other reasons. Um, which are useful for this reason, um, which have very nice descriptions. So, so this is kind of an ugly description as an infinite graph. It's, it's, it's not very helpful. And it turns out that there are examples uh, that are adjunct and which are finite. Like for example, those, um, those constructions here, the gadget replacement and the PP power, specifically the, the, the edge subdivision and the K walk power. Um, those are very simple examples of um, adjunctions, and because of that, we, we have immediately some examples of reductions between PCSP problems. Um, it turns out that when we studied a few examples of such uh, example, adjuncts that were known from the literature um, on, on graph homomorphisms, it turns out that all the reductions, well, quite a few of those reductions we, um, we observed, turned out to be, well, surprisingly powerful. So, so let's look first at the example of, of gamma k. So gamma k, the scale walk power, as I said, it has this left adjunct, the, the subdivision uh, by k. But uh, it's known in graph theory and the study of graph homomorphisms that it also has a right adjunct from omega k. So gamma k has a left adjunct, lambda k, but it also has a right adjunct, omega k, interestingly. Um, um, the description is quite technical, but like the intuition is that omega k uh, g, it behaves like topological subdivision on the box complex. It like blows out your graph um, into a, a larger and larger value. Um, or, or if you have any face, any surface, for example, and you think of the graph as a triangulating or quadrangulating the surface, uh, then omega k makes that triangulation uh, denser and denser as k increases. Uh, so formally, um, and the, we have the following statement that uh, the box complex of omega kg is equivalent uh, of the continuous transformation to uh, the box complex of G. And for example, this can be used to, to show that the chromatic number of the graph um, is at least, this, this graph omega k applied to click is at least n. Uh, just by the Wolfsuckel M theorem, because this graph looks like a sphere, like Kn, uh, I mentioned before, it looks like a sphere. Omega k just blows the sphere and makes it the denser and denser triangle, which was a very simple sphere, but as a topological space, we get the same topological space. So it's still a sphere of dimension n minus two, and because of that, it cannot have a homomorphism into a smaller sphere. That's by the particle and theorem, because uh, you, you do not have an equivalent map from a larger dimensional sphere to a small dimensional sphere. So you can use this to show that the uh, chromatic number of this graph is at least n, and this can be used to prove, for example, uh, counterexamples to Hedonius conjecture. 
and the smallest counter examples we know that follow for precisely from this construction. So that's why people, um, for one of the many reasons people study this construction. Um, it's actually much, much stronger in that for any continuous map from the box complex of G to box complex of H, for any continuous map between those topological spaces, as twisted as you want, uh, any such continuous map can be turned into graph homomorphisms, uh, not from G to H, but from omega KG to H. So like I said, the, the, you get a dense and a denser triangulation, and this eventually allows you to, 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 to um, rephrase this continuous map, to see this continuous map, to represent it as, as an actual graph homomorphism. And we use this property to uh, show that, in a sense, only topology matters. So these are maybe uh, abstract properties, uh, like topological properties, but uh, uh, as you see, they, they, they have implications for purely graph theoretical questions like continuous conjecture. And it turns out they have implications, very nice implications also for uh, studying PCSP problems. Namely, we get the following theorem. So say H is a graph such that PCSP uh, from any graph and, uh, with any graph G and H is always half. So this PSP G H uh, is always NP half, right? So that's the, that's the property we showed for H equal to K3. And say we have a graph H prime, which has the same topology. So if you look at the box complexes, say we have a graph that has the same topology. Then uh, I claim that we can show that H prime again has this property that uh, PCSP G H prime is half, is NP half for all G. So, so this means that this property that we proved for K3, uh, it only depends on the topology of the box complex of K3. So it only, we really only relied on the fact that, um, that uh, the box complex of K3 is a circle. And indeed you can, you can uh, view from the proof for the case of K3 that, uh, that we only really relied on, on the fact that the topology of, of K3 is a circle, but, but it's actually true in general. That, uh, if you were able to prove this for any graph and um, you, you replace it with any graph of the same topology, we'd have the same result. So we strongly suggest that uh, topology, well, it should be the best way to prove these kinds of results. And the proof here, I don't want to go into the details, but just to show you uh, that it's, it's a very simple application of just the definitions and, and those properties uh, of, of the functor omega k that I mentioned. Right? This is the whole proof. So, so it's a very simple proof from, from uh, well, some basic principles, some basic algebraic principles, and then, uh, well, this very strong property of, of omega k, this kind of magical factor that, that, that has these very nice properties. So, so that's one example. Mm, but another very interesting example uh, is the arc digraph construction. So again, it's a different uh, construction. So it's similar to the line graph, but uh, it's best defined for digraphs. So for digraph D, uh, we construct a digraph delta D as follows. So its vertices are simply the arcs of D, and the arcs of delta D are the pairs U, V, D, V, W uh, of arcs in D. So those pairs of arcs in the original graph where well, the endpoints here match. So it's like the line graph for undirected graphs, but it's defined as a, as a directed graph. And the striking property of this, this uh, construction is that it de decreases the chromatic number in the controlled way. Uh, so the chromatic number of a digraph, I just look at the undirected graph uh, and, and look at the chromatic number of that. Or in other words, uh, like formally, the property is the following, that uh, for any undirected graph, I look at it as a directed graph with um, edges in both directions. I apply delta to g. And then that's delta G, it admits a homomorphism to Kn. It is uncolorable if and only if G is colorable with n choose n half colors. And so, so in other words, the chromatic number of delta G is determined by the chromatic number of G. Namely, it's, it's the smallest number n such that uh, n choose n half is at least the chromatic number of G. So, so in other words, this means that the chromatic number of, of delta G is roughly uh, logarithmic and the chromatic number of G. It's exactly, uh, that, that you can actually uh, specify a function here that's exactly some function of the chromatic number of G. But like, like the main point is that it decreases the chromatic number of the control way. 
Um, on the other hand, you see this is very similar to injunction, and in fact, this is an injunction. So, so in fact, th this construction delta, uh, it has a right-hand joint, and it's just that the right-hand joint in this case, when applied to a click KM, uh, turns out to be um, a very nice graph, namely K, uh, another click, much large click, of size n to n half. And by this property of a junction, by this very simple definition that I, that, uh, I showed before, uh, this means that we have a reduction uh, from PCSP on those larger clicks to PCSP on the smaller clicks. Okay, so, so just for free, for just by applying this construction um, and this property known from the study of your homomorphism, we get this very interesting uh, construction. Then if you know that uh, this problem, this PCSP problem for large chromatic numbers is NP hard, then this implies that this problem for a smaller chromatic number is NP hard as well. And this allows us to show two interesting things. Uh, one thing it allows us to show is, is to improve the state of the art for, uh, for this, uh, for this NP hardness of PCSP K and KK problems. Namely, the state of the art before was once here, and that this is NP hard if uh, N is large enough and K is uh, something like exponential in N. So that's the largest gap that was known to hold. That's the largest gap for which we still know now that, that this problem is NP hard. It's something uh, roughly exponential. Um, and by applying this reduction over and over, so the exact proof is pretty technical, but the idea is just to apply this uh, as much as possible. If we apply this reduction as much as possible, then what we get is the following, that PCSP K and KK is NP hard for any k that's at most uh, n choose and a half minus one, and any n that's uh, at least four. So that's interesting for two reasons. One is that uh, this form now, uh, it's, it applies even to very small n, even to n equals to four. And secondly, this function is, is stronger than Huang sphere n. It's roughly two to the n over square root n. So it's a larger gap than Huang sphere n. So just by this very simple construction, we are able to, to uh, using Quang Speed as a black box, we are able to improve it to, uh, to something more. And another corollary of, of, of this reduction is the following. Say we want to show that, uh, we want to consider the property of the graph G, that PCSPGH is NP hard for all graphs H. So this is like, similar to the, uh, the property we've proved for K3, but now it's the other way around. Now, now the G is a fixed graph, uh, and we ask, is it true that PCSPG for any graph H is NP hard? Um, the thing you can show is that if there is any such graph, all time graph really, then K4 is such a graph. Uh, in fact, uh, later we, ordered, uh, we were able to improve it to K3, and the idea is, Sorry. The idea is that, uh, well, the, the idea of improvement from K4 to K3 is simply that uh, if you apply the arc graph construction twice, uh, like delta of delta of K4, without forgetting about the, uh, the orientations uh, when applying the second delta, then this, this digraph admits a homomorphism K3, and that's what allows to reduce the K4 case to K3. And in general, the property we use is that whatever graph or digraph you have, uh, you can apply delta many, many times, and if you do that sufficiently many times, you will get a graph that is free colorable, or a digraph that admits a homomorphism to K3. Um, and then this result follows very, very easily. So, so that's uh, what we're able to get uh, from this very simple reduction. So a question, uh, Martian? Yeah. So is there a sense in which this delta is like the extremal? Could there be another miraculous adjunct which allows you to go even bigger than n choose n over two is there anything known in that regard yeah so that's a very good question and we really have no idea so, so that's a problem I'll, so this kind of graph construction those adjunct graph constructions were studied before in graph theory and, and uh, they have many many different applications but the situation was always very similar that we have those two examples the delta graph construction and this omega k graph construction, which prove very interesting results. And then we don't know many more uh, interesting examples. Somehow it's, it's very hard to, 
like it's it's a very nice uh, theory. It's a very nice definition um, with surprisingly nice corollaries, but it doesn't tell you which where to look for interesting constructions, unfortunately. Um, yeah, specifically for, for, for this question, uh, I don't know how to look for, for better construction. We know that for delta, uh, if you apply delta over and over, then K3 is the best um, undirected graph for which you can prove this. Uh, so this, this is the best you can do with, with uh, this specific construction. Uh, actually, if you look at digraphs, then um, then you, delta K3 is something earlier in the homomorphism model. So you can prove something slightly stronger, maybe that PCSP Delta K3 is hard, or delta square K3 is hard, and so on and on. So you can apply delta as many times as you want, but, uh, but it's always a digraph. This, this will get you a digraph that always contains uh, a directed cycles. So, so it's only interesting if you care about directed graphs. If you care about undirected graphs, this is the best so we can do with this construction. And we don't know any, any construction which would uh, do something similar, or which would do something interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So those those are the open problems. Like this is precisely one one of um, kind of very broad open problems. Uh, we we have this nice definition of adjoint functions. We know that many simple examples give us very powerful reductions. Uh, but the question is, are there other interesting examples of such as adjoint functions? So more specifically, we know that uh, in in those interesting cases. Uh, I mentioned that omega k is the right tangent of a function of gamma k, which is itself a right tangent to uh, lambda k. So we have actually triples of the tangent functors. And the same is true for delta. And uh, it's interesting to, to, to look at these triples of, of, of finite tangent functors and to ask if, if any exists. And there's not much known about it. Uh, it seems we should look at more, more interesting construction than just gadget constructions. Uh, so another open question is, is uh, we used uh, Huang's help as a result here as a black box. So I think it would be very interesting to try to look at the proof and apply data here directly and see, uh, see if those two proofs can be merged into one and if it gives something more powerful. Uh, it could be hard because Huang's proof is not based on the algebraic approach, but more on, on like analytic properties of polymorphisms. Uh, but, but I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, another question here is that, um, well, topology is not the first time it has been used for, even for promise uh, CSPs. Um, uh, there's a very prominent example uh, by Dino Regan and Smith, uh, where they used um, also the borsa cohen theorem to prove hardness of hypergraph coloring. And uh, for, for other notions of hypergraph coloring, there's similar uh, ways to apply topology. But all those ways are, uh, seem to be very different from the way we apply topology. So, it would be interesting to find a common uh, denominator in all these proofs. Uh, and so far, we, we were unable to, to find any of this. And then finally, um, well, for this topological proof, it's, it would be very interesting to push it further, namely to push it to uh, PCSP for odd cycles versus the next click, so K4. Uh, this would mean that we would have to understand maps from the n torus into S2. Or if you take this equivariance under account, it, uh, maybe a better way is to think of it as the maps from Entoros to the projective plane. And well, we, we're working on that with, and hopefully if we understand the topology enough, we can, we can prove something. But then the problem is, uh, well, we hope uh, we can do something for K5 and so on. But as soon as you get uh, to K5 already, uh, there's a problem, namely that if you look at continuous maps that correspond to them, uh, even just to projections, then uh, the, the continuous maps you get uh, up to continuous transformations, they satisfy all minor conditions. So, so that means that uh, this box F, uh, this, uh, if you forget all this combinatorial information, it, uh, it turns out that the function you get, it, it doesn't have any interesting information anymore and it's used as for, for proving hardness. But somehow we proved that uh, uh, those things only depend on topology, that the hardness of this problem uh, only depends on the topology of K5. So it's not quite a contradiction, but it's something um, I think we, we don't quite understand. We don't know how to use topology in a different way, um, where we don't just look at the topology of one function, but we do something different. And really, it's, it's an open question. What could we do differently uh, in those cases? Uh, so that's all I have to say. So thanks a lot for listening.
Thanks, Martin. Uh, other questions? So maybe I'll, maybe this is what he said in the first point here, triples, I miss, might have missed it. Is there a theory of adjuncts for higher parity relations, which, you know, could that shed light on some mm -hmm. other problems? So definitely you, 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 you can use the same definitions for, for other relational structures. Um, everything works the same. It's still an, an adjunctness uh, uh, of, of uh, construction on, on relational structure. It will imply all this. Uh, a reduction between PCSP problems, um, but th there, there are examples of, of functors that uh, people would use in each literature. Like the graph homomorphism, where I study a lot, but hypergraph homomorphism is not so much. Um, I don't know of any any natural example of that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 very underexplored. Like may maybe there's some very simple example of functors on on, on hypergraphs that would prove interesting uh, results as well. Hmm. Some more questions? I might actually have a question in, uh, in the meantime. Uh, do you think there might be some quadruples of uh, adjoint functors? Mm, no idea, no idea. Uh, it's It's, it's really hard to look for them and to, to, to like, it seems it's not the right like, definition. It's not the right approach to, to take this very general definition of adjunct functor that you ask uh, what are the possibly, what are the possibly adjunct functors. I mean, there, there's the, there is this work of uh, Tardif and, and um, others that, that showed that uh, uh, if you add some restrictions, like if you require the, the leftmost and the next left to be, to be actual adjuncts and, and category of in the sense of category theory, um, and then we ask about the third adjunct, then there's only a few examples, but um, um, yeah, in, in general, you, you don't have to restrict it to, uh, as, you don't have to, ask, there's no need to assume that restriction that was there in the paper, and then um, I have no idea how to even start looking for, for such functors. Like, um, there, there is this idea to look at, uh, instead of, Graph constructions that would play an edge with, with a gadget or a gadget with an edge, like in DP powers, uh, to do replacement gadget with gadgets. Like this is something you mentioned at some point. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not not obvious how to. How I to think that's just that and... that's just what, this replacing gadget with gadget. That's basically what what Tardif does. I think. I know there's, there's some very general principles in category theory that say that you cannot have more than five or something like this. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know the proof of what it really means. You cannot have more than five adjoint yeah, functors. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the reason statement like this. I'm for not certain. exactly okay. sure, but, but I think it works for like any categories. Um, okay. And for some reason, you cannot have more than five. Interesting. Okay, but so I don't, more also, I don't know any any, any example of uh, four <laughs> in the case of graphs. Maybe before before we get too deep into category theory, are there some more questions? If not, um, I guess uh, thanks, Martin. Thanks a lot.